Hey guys, this is Jan for Chess24 and we do what we do on this side, we take a look at the game of the Chess World Champion. Magnus Carlsen faced Maxim Vashilagraf in the 11th round of the Tata Steel Masters. Magnus Carlsen in the sole lead before this 11th round and his opponent Maxim Vashilagraf, one of his closest pursuers that we see Carlsen on 7.5 out of 10, Maxim Vashilagraf in shared second on 6.5 out of 10. Carlsen famously won six games in a row earlier, then was stopped in the 10th round, in the one just before this one, by none other than Vasil Ivanchuk, who kind of forced a draw with the white pieces. Let's see how Carlsen himself handles the white pieces today. He could go, of course, for something solid, trying to maintain his lead, or he could just do what he does and think, I'm, I'm white, I'm the best player in the world, I'm trying to win this game. Or do both, of course, and if you take a close look at the picture, you can see that he chose the move 1d4 today. Which he does sometimes, he uses in this tournament to beat Levon Aronian, but recently we've seen him play a lot more e4 in his match against, Ma against Vichy Anand and in this very tournament. So 1d4 against MVL is a curious choice because the Frenchman is very consistent with his openings. If you go 1d4, you will get the Grunfeld Indian defense. If you go 1e4, you will get the Neidorf. And to my mind, he's more vulnerable in the Neidorf than in the Grunfeld. But of course, with Carlsen going 1d4, he has a very specific idea in mind. MVL goes knight of 6, c4, g6, knight c3, d5. This is the Grunfeld which a lot of strong white players are trying to avoid these days, making it even more curious to see what the world champion has in store here. C takes D, Knight takes D5, E4, takes takes, Bishop G7. This is the main line of the, whatever we want to call it, exchange Grunfeld, where white is mainly trying to maintain his powerful pawn center and finish development, while black is trying the opposite. He's trying to undermine white's powerful pawn center before white can finish, finish development. And this is what the theoretical battles normally are about. Knight f3, bishop c4 or bishop e3 are all established main lines in this position. Carlsen goes for the move, too many arrows again, goes for the move bishop to e3, reinforcing the d4 square and clearing the way for the rook on c1. Keep in mind that there is a theoretical line, knight f3, c5, rook b1, which is a main line here that will become very, very relevant later. I will tell you why. Just keep it in mind for now. Bishop e3, clearing the way for rook c1, and after c5, rook c1 is indeed played. Might not look like the main priority, but it's a very useful move for white. He, the rook abandons this very long diagonal, and protects the pawn on c3. So if black tries to keep attacking the center with a move like knight c6, white can now go d5, and c3 is covered, and this knight is attacked. So rook c1 is an established main line. There's many different move orders here, but this is the latest one, one could say, forcing black to castle first, and only now committing his knight to f3, allowing it to be pinned with bishop g4, but of course, white had to continue his development, and knight of three, bishop e2, castles is the harmonious way to do it. MVL plays bishop g4, which is not strictly the main line in this position. Queen a5 is a more popular move, either in this move order or instead of castles. But it's nothing the Frenchman enjoys all that much, it seems like. Normally white goes queen d2, and here we've seen many games, especially by former world champion Vladimir Kramnik on the white side, in this ending. And after king takes or knight takes, white has some chances to get an advantage, even though the theoreticians surely will uphold black's chances as well. However, nothing MVL likes all that much, and he plays a move he has played before, bishop g4, very logical move, once again, putting pressure on this knight, which defends the center. All very Grunfeldish stuff. Bishop to e2 is played, the natural move, unpinning and preparing to castle. I believe we have footage of Carlsen playing bishop e2. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not the right spot. I'll find it. Here we are. 
looks in the air. But of course, this is his preparation. And what has to be noted is that Maxime Vashila Graf played this position already with both colors, with black and with white. So he knows very, very much what he's doing here. He won't spend a lot of time on the move. Queen a5, there it comes. Carlsen spends a lot of time writing down the moves. I'm wondering if that's a problem for him if he ever gets low on time and spends like 40 seconds to write down QA5. I'm not quite sure what he's doing there. But now it seems like he did finish and he can focus back on the game. He is gonna castle, little spoiler there, leaving his pawn on A2 on Priest. And just to show you that both guys aren't really thinking here MVL bangs out the move, queen takes a2. This is a theory battle which you see every day in the Grunfeld defense, but you don't see it every day in the games of Magnus Carlsen, who normally tries to take the game out of the realms of theory ASAP. Not today. Still, let's make sense of the moves played for a second. Bishop e2, logical. Queen a5 is also extremely logical because Black is trying to get something out of white before he manages to conclude his development. And queen a5 threatens c takes d4 now that white can't recapture because this pawn would be pinned. And at the same time it attacks the pawn on a2. There is a move that covers, parries both these threats, the move queen to d2. But it is a little clumsy at this stage and black has done quite well in practice. I believe they play knight d7 here playing to put a rook on d8, and black has been doing fine. So the theoretical battle is focused on the move castles, and queen takes a2. When white managed to achieve all his goals, to finish development and keep his beautiful center, but it did cost him a pawn. I don't like this color, like this. It did cost him a pawn. Black is a bit behind in development, but he has one trump for the future, which is his past a pawn. So if all things go wrong, you can always push this a pawn up the board and see what happens. In a lot of the games in this line and in similar lines go like this. So this is all theory and the games of MVL, who is the leading hero of this line, have focused on the move rook to a1. He played, I believe, queen e6 himself with black against Boris Gelfand. And then later he repeated the line with white against Fabiano Carana and Fabiano improved with the move queen to b2. Looks like he's trying to lose this queen, but this is modern times, modern engines having checked out all these lines. Looks like MVL was confident repeating it with black today. And Carlsen did not go for the move rook a1, but introduced his own little novelty, the move rook to b1. Basically attacking the b7 pawn before black is ready to defend it comfortably. The most logical move seems to be b6, stopping white from going, rook takes b7, but b6 weakens this diagonal mainly and with it the light squares in white's camp. Here's some tempting options here, h3, one of them, bishop takes, bishop takes, let's say knight c6, e5. And in such a position, even though white is a pawn down, I actually prefer his side because he has the powerful bishops. This pawn on e5 really restricts black bishop on g7 quite badly. It's going to be quite easy for white to generate an initiative on the light squares here. To rook a c8, let's say queen d3, such position. White is just better. And this is what Carlsen surely had in mind, or something along these lines. After b6 there is also rook a1 now, which is also quite tempting. So b6 wouldn't have been good and MVL knows this. I'm, I think he's familiar with this position. He analyzed it. So did Carlsen, of course. So after very little thinking, he goes for c takes d, c takes d. And once again decides not to cover this pawn with b6, but instead knight c6 finishing his development. And the funny thing is, even though 12 rook b1 was a novelty, the position we have after knight c6 all of a sudden is very well known to theory. Now this might sound strange, but I told you earlier to keep in mind the position after bishop g7, knight f3, c5, rook b1, one of the main lines. And the main line of this main line is castles, bishop e2, c takes d, c takes d, queen a5 check, bishop d2, queen takes a2, castles, 
bishop g4, bishop e3, and knight to c6. When all of a sudden we have the same position we got in the game. It occurred very differently in this rook b1 line, white first goes bishop d2, then bishop e3, while in the game he went rook c1 and then rook b1, but it did lead to the same position. And I believe Carlsen's train of thought was not only, I find this position interesting, but also my opponent might not be that familiar with this position. Because via this move order with knight f3, bishop e2 and rook b1, MVL almost never goes for c takes d and queen a5 check. In this position he prefers the move knight to c6, d5, knight e5, which is another completely different, very, very complicated system of the Grunfeld defense. So Carlsen's novelty, rook b1, was also aimed at transposing to another line which he thought his opponent might not be that familiar with. Which is kind of stuff I find very fascinating. It's nothing you normally see Carlsen embark in. He tries to get a position where both guys are out of book quickly, where he can use his superior playing skills, but it looks like today Maybe he wanted to limit the risk and therefore go for a theory battle. Or since a rest day before this game was in place, he listened to his second, Peter Hanen Nielsen, who showed him some tricks in this line. Certainly very interesting. However, he did not get that lucky because MVL banged out his moves and he clearly was still familiar with this position. Carson played rook takes b7 here. d5 actually is a valid alternative, probably even played more often than rook takes b7, but rook takes b7, restoring the material balance is the safest choice here for sure. Rook a b8, now the position has stabilized a bit, black has his pieces out, queen on a2, might look a bit strange, but it's also active and annoying for white. White has managed to keep his powerful pawn center and he's gonna try to push these pawns up the board to maybe create a passed pawn on the d-file or switch his attention to the weak e7 pawn. Well, black still has his very simple plan of pushing the a-pawn. Still all theory, the theoretical main move in this position is the move rook to c7. Played for example in a game between Wesley So and Fabiano Carana. Then black goes rook fc8, now you are forced to exchange and the rook recaptures. The reasoning behind going for this rook to c7 move is that People argue that the rook on c8 is placed worse than the rook on b8 after the exchange of rooks. Carlsen thinks differently and he goes for the move rook takes b8, all still clearly part of his preparation, rook takes b8 and h3. Even though I've been speaking for a while already, this position is still known to theory, albeit via a different move order, and bishop d7 is the only move that really takes it out of theory or at least out of previously played games. Bishop takes f3 has been played before but then white is a bit better after bishop f3, rook d8 and d5. Black has quite a tough fight ahead for a draw. So instead MVL correctly decides to keep this bishop on the board. I believe he still remembered this as well or was still in book so can't say that Carlsen's surprise went that well in the opening. However, White has some chances to claim an advantage here, while he can't really be worse if he does not do anything crazy with his a-pawn. So it's not such a bad practical choice at least. Carlsen goes for the move d5, very typical, gains space on the center and opens this diagonal for his bishop, knight to e5 and bishop to f4. Here we see one reason why he might have preferred this rook on b8 instead of on c8, as in the other line with rook c7. It is on this diagonal and after knight takes f3, bishop takes f3, it is now attacked and forced to waste some time, which it does with rook b4. Rook b7, by the way, very valid alternative, looks more passive, but covers the 7th rank, especially the b c7 square and might be an interesting move here as well. Rook b4, the more natural move played in the game. Queen to c1, I suspect all of this is still Carlsen homework, even though around here he started taking time as well. Very interesting to see theory battle Magnus Carlsen, not something we see every day, especially with the white pieces. 
queen to c1, threatening queen to c7, black has to stop that, goes rook c4, and queen to b1, trying to take over the other open file, even at the cost of exchanging queens. MVL goes along with the queen exchange, but on his own terms, he plays the move queen b2, allowing the ending, which could either be good for black or could be bad for black. It's very, very concrete. The truth is somewhere in the middle. You could argue that queen a4 was a better alternative, leaving the queens on the board. And after queen b7, I guess this is the move he was afraid of, to just play a5. Looks a little clumsy for black, but there is nothing concrete. And it seems at first sight, at least, I didn't check it that carefully, like black should be all right here. Instead, MVL goes for the ending with queen b2, queen takes, bishop takes, and as usual, I've said it before, white has to act very quickly before this pawn starts running, but he does, and he is in time to create quite some problems for black. Rook to b1, now this bishop can't really move because wherever it goes, there would be rook to b7 winning. So the idea was to play rook b4 and keep it where it is, once again, threatening to move this pawn up the board. But now white is just in time to go bishop to e3, I believe that's what he played, intending bishop to c5 or bishop takes a7. Interesting alternative here was a move bishop to d2, which one could analyze further as well, once again leading to endings where black has to suffer a little bit. Bishop d2 could have been even stronger than bishop to e3 as played in the game actually. Bishop e3 is more concrete, it's winning the pawn back. a5 kind of forced black wants to keep this pawn on the board. Bishop to c5, and here we see the idea. This double attack yields white a pawn. Rook to b5, bishop takes e7. The situation has clarified a bit. Black goes bishop e5, offering the exchange of rooks, which white has to go for, because if white allows everything as it is, the a pawn sounds like a broken record, but the a-pawn will run up the board. So you have to go for this. And we have a very rare side. We have an endgame with four bishops, where white is a pawn up, but black has a dangerous passed pawn on the side. What is clear is that only white is playing for a win, and black has to suffer. He does have decent drawing chances, first of all because of the counterplay, and then because of the reduced material, his plan should be to reduce material even further. This is a very common technique. If you're worse, you're a pawn down in an ending, what you want to do is exchange more pawns. And this should be Black's goal. He wants to exchange pawns on the king side, while ideally not losing his a pawn, of course. While White's goal is to not exchange that many pawns, White would probably be okay with exchanges of bishops, because if pieces disappear from the board, it makes his extra pawn even more powerful. It gives his king easier access to the center. So often the attacker, the side with the pawn up, is fine exchanging pieces. The side with the pawn down is fine exchanging pawns. And that applies here as well. Long speech, the position is quite concrete and you have to make good moves. I was a bit surprised by bishop g4, which of course is played in order to support his own pass pawn, d6, d7, d8, all of a sudden a very concrete threat. But black also, of course, has his pass pawn to lean on. I was expecting the move bishop to a3 instead, more passive, just blocking this pawn as quickly as possible and then taking it from there. Bishop g4 followed, <coughs> black followed with bishop b2, which creates counterplay with this guy by covering the a3 square. And after d6 now, black would play the move a4, intending after d7 to temporarily give up a piece, bishop takes, bishop takes, and now a3. It turns out this pawn will cost a piece as well. Can't allow a2, a1. So white would have to take, bishop takes a3, bishop takes a3. And this ending with opposite color bishops is just a dead draw. Opposite color bishops, pawns on one flank. There's not much to do for either side. This was not Carlsen's intention, so he went bishop b2, bishop to c5. <clears throat> not forcing the issue just yet, but 
getting his bishop out of the way before pushing this pawn so the bishop can become active in defense as well. White goes a4, of course, threatening a3. White has to do something about that, and he does. He retreats with bishop d1. However, it seems like that shows this bishop g4 operation wasn't all that successful because on the next two moves he had to go bishop c5 back and bishop d1 back to defend against this pawn advancing. And now MVL does what I've mentioned earlier. He goes about exchanging some pawns on the king side. f5, very strong move. Exchanges a pair of pawns and gives his king access to the middle. This, by the way, is another interesting difference between passed pawns. If you have a central passed pawn, it's sometimes less, less valuable than a passed pawn on the flank because it can be controlled a lot more easily by the opponent's king. Like here, the d pawn can be kept in check quite, quite easily now by the black king after king f7, while the white king has a very long way to go until it can influence the a pawn. Just something to keep in mind. So f5, e takes f5, f3 was possible, but then just king f7 and there is not all that much that white can do to make progress, while black has reasonably easy play here, bringing his king up to f7 and f6. So e takes f5 is a bad try, g takes f5 and f4 fixing this pawn. King to f7, however now it turns out, once again, it's hard for white to really activate his king, it's not clear where the king would be going. He still could have and maybe should have tried the move king to f2, then after something like a3, bishop b3, let's say h5, stopping g4, it's very hard to see how white is intending to make any progress. Instead, Carlson went for the move g4, gaining space, but allowing black to get rid of more pawns. And he does. He first goes bishop c1, attacking the f4 pawn, forcing bishop to d6. And now, I believe, there is video footage of MVL exchanging more pawns. Once again, I have to jump to the right moment. Here we are. <clears throat> Come on, make a move. Sorry. Now he might make a move. There, there we are. He goes f takes g, reducing the number of pawns. Not sure my body language doctor skills will be very helpful here. Carlson looks cool, calm and collected as he normally does. MVL, it's hard to tell. He just looks focused here. We got him thinking about the position. How can I get rid of more pawns? F takes g4. H takes g4. Starts with a3. Never a bad idea trying to queen his own pawn. Bishop to b3, of course, stopping this pawn. And bishop to d7, attacking the g4, g4 pawn. Very good defensive technique here by Maxim Vashila Graf. After f5, maybe the most natural move, black would go h5. And he once again manages to get more exchanges in. g takes h, bishop takes f5. Here, even though white remains a pawn up, the material would be highly reduced and black has enough counterplay to make an easy draw here with his a pawn. Similar thing in the game. Carlson chooses g5 instead of f5, but once again, MVL exchanges one more pawn, gets rid of this weakness, plays the move h6, very strong move. g takes h6, king g6, recovering one pawn. White can't keep them all. And this position is a dead draw. White is left with an extra pawn, but they're not going anywhere. They're both in the center, easily controlled by the black king together with his bishops. While there is still the nuisance of the a3 pawn binding some of white's attention, especially this bishop, so there is just nothing white can hope for. And even if he were to reach an ending with two bishops against one bishop with no pawns, that would still be a draw. However, he's not even going to get there. This position is a dead draw. Black is too active, too coordinated. It's just nothing to do. And this happened pretty quickly after bishop a2, bishop b2, bishop e5. Bishop f5, like just puts his pieces on good squares and then waits. d6, bishop back to d7, bishop b1, check, king f7, king e4, bishop c6, check, forcing the king away. And Carlsen also, of course, is aware there's nothing to do here. And he goes for a move repetition with king f5, bishop d7, king e4, bishop c and draw agreed. Bishop c6 would repeat the moves. Very interesting game. In my opinion, some might have found it a boring theory battle, but I enjoy those things. 
First of all, to see Carlsen entering a theory battle, especially after 1d4, is not something we see every day. Then he had an interesting new idea with a move rook to b1. Transposing into a position his opponent was probably not that familiar with, or so he thought. <clears throat> after rook takes b7, rook a, b8. And here he had another interesting new idea, funnily enough. With rook takes b8 instead of rook c7. And after rook takes, rook takes h3. Black was forced to defend quite precisely. I think MVL did a very good job starting with bishop d7. And then holding this slightly inferior ending with very good defensive technique later in the game. So in my book a very well played game by both sides. Of course you could argue with hindsight should Carlsen have gone e4 and then played something random out of theory and put pressure there. You never know but it certainly makes him more scary for his opponents that he's able to play both 1e4 and 1d4 and also to enter the occasional theory battle and have ideas here. So end of the day a draw Magnus Carlsen maintains the lead in Vike Anze. I would like to thank you for your attention for watching this video. Two rounds left in Vike Anze. It's gonna be exciting. Thanks for watching guys. Bye bye.